everyone. Welcome back to Rolling Solo. My name is Adam Smith. We're going to continue our learn to play of Burn Cycle from Chip Theory Games. If you haven't checked out my first video, I'll put a link to it in the top right hand corner. It'll get you caught up to where we are right now. We're about to go through some of the basics of the game and we're going to get into the tutorial and learn about what we see here on the table. So without further ado, let's talk about planning ahead. Just before we dive in, I want to make one mention of a correction in terms of where the power was situated for access after we routed some power. It should have been on 7. You'll see it here on 7 currently in the blue area there. The peg is on 7. It was on 6. And that's because I mistakenly said that access was going to be using 2 power as well as byte using 2 power in order to open up a burn cycle slot on the command module when in actuality it only costs 3. So we're only using 1 power with access so we stop at 6. Seven. This has been mentioned in the pin comment in the prior video and now you're seeing it here just in case it was missed. When you're playing Burn Cycle, you're going into a heist. And in order to successfully pull off a heist, you're going to need to plan ahead. There's some bulleted notes that are worth mentioning off the top. The mission card and its objectives are something you need to focus on. The threat card and its consequences is something you also want to keep in your purview because that is going to tell you what kind of nastiness is coming down the line. The captain's card and the unit chip is something else you want to become familiar with. This is all the information you want to know going into your mission. And then each team member's bot card, including the command module you're controlling, in this case, our command module is going to be bit. But knowing those individuals and what they offer and can bring to the table can really help in a successful heist. Let's go over a couple things to keep top of mind inside a burn cycle. First off, movement is orthogonal in this game. Diagonals do not matter. The word may is going to show up, and when it does, it'll let you know that that ability or effect is optional. If you don't see the keyword may inside of the sentence or statement that is on a card or within the game text, then you have to do it, at least as much as is possible in that moment, and ignore the rest beyond. Now, it's also worth mentioning there's no hidden information, so that's why this works really well in a solo capacity. You can have both your agents like I do with byte and access and also the command module bit and you have all that information in front of you to use in order to be successful at your heist so get used to the individuals you are carrying out your heist with and if a card's text conflicts with the game's rules the card's text always takes precedence. Now it's good to get an idea as to how units are described within Burn Cycle. First off, agents are bots that each player has control over. So the agents that I have are Axis. You can see Axis way up there in the top left hand corner. Byte we just saw in the previous shot. And then we also have the command module, which is also considered a bot. So agents and the command module fall under the umbrella of the keyword bot. As I set up in the prior video, BIT is the command module that we are using. Now let's move to security units, and security units comprise of guards and captains. We've already set up a whole bunch of guards. Most of those are generally found in the hallways of every floor. You can see one in the top left-hand corner there, and you can also discover some of them in rooms. We set one up inside the security room based on this floor for this corporation's mission, and you also are going to run into captains. We set those up as well. They're often found on the final floor of the mission, and they have unique abilities, generally tougher to deal with than guards so you want to try to avoid them if you can. Before we get to the very first round of play, let's talk about the differences on the game board itself. So you understand how these rooms are structured, the hallways and everything else. So first off, we have outdoor spaces. We talked about this in the prior video. We have hallway spaces where you saw some of the guards show up and two of them currently in there. We also have room spaces, of course, room spaces are any space inside of a room. We have safe zones. They're outlined in yellow. So you'll see a safe zone up there inside the security area. You also see one over at the service elevator. We have hiding spots. These are easy to note as they have these little eye icons in two spaces across a certain space. So that is a hiding spot. Doors are really easy to recognize. They have these red arrows. Some of them here that I'm pointing to are into the hallway areas. If you find a door that is pointed to the edge of the board, they are considered to be ignored. If you see two doors that point to each other, like this one right here, it's just considered a single door. There's also cache spaces, and those have already been pre-set up with chips, those orange ones all around the map. We have terminal spaces. Those are the teal color. They're all over the place with chips as well. We have objective spaces. You'll see one in the far bottom right corner, and it has an exclamation 
Mission Mark Icon in purple. Those are gonna be used, they don't have any immediate effect, so they can be ignored unless that actual floor and corporation that you're going up against has use of it. So for this mission, nothing to worry about there. Security posts are also all over the place, and they have these little brown icons, and we've already gone ahead and set one up here in the security room, for example, would be underneath that space as well. And that's it, those are the different kind of highlight areas of all the different rooms, hallways, and outer areas of this floor. Lastly, I wanna to touch on imperatives. This is something that I set up in the prior video. So we have Byte here on the left with the remote jammer, and we have access on the right with troll sequence. Now these are preset, but normally they're randomly given, and you get an imperative per agent. But the command module, in this case for us is bit, will never ever have an imperative. So that is worth mentioning. Now what are these imperatives? Well, they represent programming protocols given to the agents by the corporation. They're hindrances, but they grant power if successfully completed. So you have these at the very beginning of the game and you can potentially get new ones when you change floors and occasionally from entering rooms or finding other game effects that might change them out. An imperative card can be disregarded. However, if an agent disobeys their imperative card, they must discard their card and lose one power. Now, similarly, they also lose one power if they choose to discard the imperative without even fulfilling it in the first place. And if an agent successfully fulfills their imperative, they discard the card and gain the amount of power showing on the card's bottom right corner. So we are now ready to jump right into the flow of a game. So the flow of burn cycles broken down into rounds and a game can consist of any number of rounds and in a round each player will take a full turn starting with the first player continuing clockwise around then the corporation is going to take a turn. So how is a player turn broken down? Well it consists of the following steps at a high level. We have route power first then building your dice pool then taking actions then navigating the network then routing power again and then degrading the burn cycle. So let's go ahead and jump right into the very first turn of the game starting with bite as the first player. So the first step as I mentioned just moments ago is that we can route power. Now bite has a chance to route power however the first route power step of the game is very rarely used because agents had a chance to route power during the setup. So it's worth mentioning that you can do it but in this situation we're going to pass by it. The next step is building your dice pool which you can see by taking a look at the power area right here and the advanced area right here in terms of dice and it'll tell you exactly how many blue or yellow dice or potentially even elite dice that you might be adding into your dice pool. So for Byte, currently it's going to be four blue dice and one yellow advanced die. So these are the dice that Byte is going to have available to her during her turn. We now get to move from building our dice pool to taking actions and the reference card that you have in front of you will give you a breakdown of those actions at a high level. So keep this facing up to remind you of what you do have available to you on your turn. However, during this tutorial, we'll be walking through specific examples of these as we move forward. The opposite side of the card also has the breakdown of the player turn. You can see right now we're at step three. The first thing we wanna try and do is get into the corporation itself. So for the first action, we're gonna place the burn cycle tracker under the first burn cycle chip. Byte is going to move for her first action. Byte is gonna to decide to roll only two basic dice for her AP check to start things out. After making her roll, she lands a two and a blank. Now before resolving the roll, Byte has the chance to use her ability Tumble Magnet, which allows her to change one die result to match another die result. So she's gonna change the blank to a two, giving her four total AP. Byte is gonna choose to move two spaces to the left, ending right in front of the door. With the remaining two AP that Byte has, she is going to actually give that two AP to the command module to allow the command module bit to move as well. Now it's important to remember that whenever you use dice, you're gonna place them back into the supply, not into your dice area. The red burn cycle tracker has moved to the second burn cycle chip which is the captain action chip. So this means that Byte must resolve the burn cycle action listed on Crucible's card which forces you to move each security unit one space in the direction they currently face. So just so you can see that visually, right on the card itself at the very top there, you'll see that the actual icon for the captain matches the icon in the burn cycle. That's what triggers that ability we just talked about and now we're gonna go ahead and move some guards. The hamster is gonna move one space to the right, the one in the top left there. It has a key underneath of it. It's taking its key with it whenever it moves, so it's gonna go along for the ride. And the walker moves one space down south, the one there in the top right. Now there's also a room guard there in the security room. This would normally have an impact to its movement as well, but the bulldog guard is currently facing the wall, so it can't move anywhere. 
Now that we've resolved the captain chip in the burn cycle, we can proceed with Byte's action. Byte wants to gain access to the first floor, so she's going to take a keypad action on the door she's adjacent to and draws one of the keypad cards. We're currently on floor one, and this is a level one keypad. Byte has to resolve the first column here. Now, she can't choose to brute force open this keypad because it's jammed. There's a jam keyword at the very bottom of the column. So instead, we're going to decide to resolve its input, which is a physical input icon. Now, there are two ways a physical input can be resolved aside from bypassing. The first is to move the burn cycle tracker to a physical action chip in the burn cycle. That's in any burn cycle slot to the right of its current position, but there are none. The other option which Byte is going to take instead is to discard a physical reserve chip she has in her own reserve. So we'll quickly go ahead and remove the physical chip from Byte's reserve. And that matches what we need to do for that first column for level one. So we've successfully unlocked the door. We successfully unlocked the door and that allows us to place a door peg in the neoprene mat to specify this, which I've done as you can see. And now we're gonna take a free move into the lobby. Now this room has not been surveilled yet, so she must immediately surveil it. She's gonna remove the surveillance bead from the lobby and rolls one of the white surveillance dice and it ends up landing on a guard icon, which is going to mean that we're gonna have a level one guard showing up because it's a level one floor. Byte is going to draw a level one guard. It's going to be a hamster based on the learn to play guide from the supply and place it on the room's security post facing the wall. Now normally that would be completely random. With a new guard in play, Byte must immediately check its awareness Awareness. The hamster has an awareness range of six. You'll see it in the brown on the chip. It does look like a nine because the chip is rotated around 180 degrees because remember when we set this guard up, it's supposed to be facing towards the wall. And that matters right now when we're talking about awareness of six because you count six directly in front of that guard, which does nothing because it's up against the wall. Perfect. But these guards also have peripheral awareness, which is half of their awareness value, meaning that they can sense or feel things within a smaller distance around them. That's not directly in a straight line in front of them. So in this case, it can sense bite. However, thanks to a very smart purchase of an ability earlier on in the prior video, we have silent entry. When Byte enters a room, she may treat the first space she moves into in the room as a hiding spot until she moves off of it. So her presence is unknown. And that's really important because Byte is not detected. That's something we'll talk about later on. For now, we're moving to the next action, the tracker moving to the next burn cycle slot. Byte's gonna decide to take another move action. So she rolls all the remainder of her dice, two basic dice and an advanced die, and gets a three, two, and a one. Byte can't use a tumble magnet to change either of the basic dice to a three, since the basic dice don't have a three side to be changed to. So instead, she turns her one into a two, which gives her four AP total. Now with this, she's going to move two space Spaces to the right. After that, she's going to go two spaces north. Now, it's important to note that while the terminal space that Byte just moved into falls within the hamster's awareness, it's also a hiding spot. And since Byte entered the hiding spot while undetected, she remains undetected. The last three AP is going to be assigned to the command module, so Bit is going to curl around into the room coming through the door. So Bit moves one space to the left, one space into the lobby, and Bit is then detected by the hamster because, well, Bit doesn't have the cool ability that Byte does, and so we're gonna have to place her awareness chip on the space with her. And then she's gonna use her last remaining AP of the three she had to move one space to the right, and the awareness chip of where she was detected by the guard remains. The reason for this is because it's an indication of the last space she was known to be. There are no more chips in the burn cycle, so the action step of Byte's turn is now done. Now let's talk quickly on a high level about the network. This is a very impactful part of the game where you have a representation of your digital presence in the corporation itself. Each agent has a peg called its IP, which can navigate the layers of the network to gain certain benefits while keeping the enemy at bay. Meanwhile, the CEO in the center there will be sending pings onto the network, attempting to track down the agent's IPs to boot them from the network and find their actual physical location. Each ring of the network is called a layer, the outermost layer is layer one, the innermost layer is layer four. Transfers are the lines that connect the layers intermittently. Each spot on the network is called a node. There are physical tech and utility nodes all over the place. The red nodes are called hubs. The hub on layer four is the core. Landing on a hub grants a benefit depending on which layer of the network the IP is on. Each agent has a network level die that we set
set up in the prior video, as does the CEO, and network levels are compared when pings and IPs come across each other on the network to determine which is booted from the network and which remains. Now the learn to play tutorial in the network section absolutely lays out this network in terms of what happens and what can be done here really well. So I recommend you check that out to find out the intricacies of how this works. We're gonna be going through a pretty simple turn here with the network for Byte. And it's because the burn cycle only contains the captain and the general action chips and Byte doesn't have any network cards currently. So the network step in general for Byte's first turn is gonna be pretty simple overall. So we're gonna place the burn cycle tracker under the first general chip in the burn cycle, which I've done off screen. And we're gonna transfer Byte's IP from its access point to the tech node is connected to. So the tracker begins at the beginning of the burn cycle. Byte's IP goes from the access point to the tech node it is connected to. Continuing to move the burn cycle tracker as she goes, Byte will use the second chip in the burn cycle to move one node clockwise, landing again on a tech node. And with her third chip, Byte has a choice here. She can either remain on layer one and continue clockwise around, or use the transfer to move into layer two. The marker has been moved to the third burn cycle slot, and she decides to stay on layer one since doing so lands her on a hub. The benefit of this hub allows Byte to increase her network level die to two. So as you can see, the network step uses the burn cycle in a similar way as the action step in that it uses a burn cycle from left to right. In this case, each chip on the burn cycle grants movement on the network with the burn cycle chip dictating which node you can move to. So you just saw me land on a hub at the very end of going through the entire burn cycle, which is great because that bumps up the network die overall, giving us a better shot at not being booted off the network by the CEO. And that is worthwhile. Now, the thing is, the CEO hasn't sent out any pings yet, but that will certainly begin in the near future. And there's a bunch of rules around positioning inside of this, how that works, how you determine who's booted and who's not. A lot of that really doesn't need to be dug into until you're further along in the tutorial. So for now, this is just getting your feet wet on what really happens here in the network area, but it is a very cool aspect of the game outside of what's happening on the floor itself. Moving along in the player turn to route power. Byte has the opportunity again to route power, but she does not want to exceed her power bank limit, so she decides to save it. The final step of your turn is degrading the burn cycle. So basically you're going to roll a burn cycle die, and if you roll a question mark side of the die for your given agent, you may choose any active chip to degrade, which you flip over to the opposite side. That includes the captain action chip if you want. Now, if you roll a number, you find the burn cycle slot corresponding to that number. If the slot has an active or non-degraded chip on it, then you're gonna degrade that chip by flipping it over. As I mentioned, if the corresponding slot is inactive or already has a degraded chip on it, you go to the next slot in numerical order until you come to an active chip. The burn cycle loops in this regard so slot one comes after slot five when determining which burn cycle chip to degrade. It's a very, very easy step. You're just gonna go ahead and roll the die and it determines what's going on unless that question mark's rolled then you've got choices. The burn cycle die for Byte lands on a four. Since there is no active chip in slot four, it degrades the next available chip, looping back around, which degrades chip one. That's gonna do it for Byte's turn. Now we go ahead and do Axis's turn. Axis does not want to route any power at the start of her turn, so she's going to go ahead and grab her dice pool, which is going to consist of quite a lot of dice. Seven basic dice and one advanced. Axis is going to take a free action to alter the burn cycle before taking any other actions. And she needs to do this because if she doesn't, her first action would have been taken on the captain action chip instead. So what she's going to do is remove the general chip in slot one and replace it with a physical chip from the team's reserve. With the free action complete, the first action is going to be for Axis to take a move action. Access wanted to ensure that she can move at least one space, so she decided to roll two basic dice, got a one and a blank. Any unused blank dice go back into her dice pool, and she uses the one AP, which goes back to the supply, to move down beside the door. Now normally taking a move action while on a physical chip grants you an extra two AP. However, Axis's imperative troll sequence requires her to forgo this benefit in order to complete the card. If Axis had taken the two additional AP, she would disobey her imperative as I mentioned and talked about earlier in the video and lose a power and the imperative card. Now since Axis's imperative is now complete, she discards this one and gains a power which will bump her up by one. Axis's power has now gone from seven up to eight. 
As you'll see way up there in the top right hand corner on the burn cycle track, we're now in the second position for action two, which lands on the captain's marker, triggering the captain's ability, which is all about moving those security units one space based on where they're facing. The two security units in the hallway have moved as they are able to move. The other two in the rooms are up against walls facing them, so they cannot move. Axis is going to take a second action in order to interact with the keypad here. And looking at the first column, since the door is level one, she sees the roll icon and rolls the keypad die to determine what input the keypad requires. After rolling the keypad die, she got a tech input. So she decides to discard the tech chip from her reserve to unlock the door. We'll simply take that chip from her reserve. We also go ahead and place a door peg to remind us that it's been successfully activated and opened. And she's gonna take a free step of movement into the hallway. Now the awareness of the hamster up there is a six, so peripheral has a three, so she has now stepped to be within the peripheral awareness of the hamster, causing her to be detected, so she places her awareness chip on her space. Going into Axis's final action, action three, again, with the tracker moving on the burn cycle slots, we have one advanced die and six basic action dice left in her dice pool. So with her last action, she's gonna roll all of them for movement and she's going to probably get quite a bit of AP. She lands the following results, a two on the advanced die, three basic dice have one on them and three basic dice are blank. Two of the blanks can be combined for one AP, so Axis has a total of six AP she can use. She's gonna move two spaces to the right, keeping her awareness chip with her since she's still detected by the hamster as she goes. Now that Axis is adjacent to the hamster, its ability of grapple one will trigger and this requires an additional AP to be used in order to move away from this guard. So Axis has to spend two of her remaining four AP to move one more space to the right. With the last two AP, she moves down two spaces and since this is the final space outside the awareness of the hamster, her awareness chip is dropped on the space above her. That's gonna do it, so now we move to the network for access. So the first chip in the burn cycle is a physical chip and I have my marker there. She transfers her IP to layer one. Then she moves her IP towards the physical node on that layer. However, there's a hub before the physical node, so she stops on the hub instead. The benefit of the layer one hub allows her to increase her network level by one. So the die has been ticked up from one to two. With the captain action chip in the burn cycle, she transfers into layer two. And with the general action chip afterwards, she moves clockwise one node landing on the utility node. She's now moved into layer number two and clockwise one node landing on the utility one. Routing powers next, Access knows that Byte is about to complete the floor one objective, which is to access a terminal, and that's gonna grant three power to all agents. And since bots cannot have more than 10 power and Access has eight in her power bank currently, she routes one power to activate her repair ability, bringing her power bank down to seven. Moving right along, we're gonna degrade the burn cycle. Access rolls the burn cycle die, land at three. The general action chip in slot three gets degraded by being flipped over. Access's turn is now over. And as I set up in the prior video, since the corporation marker is in front of her, this means that the corporation's turn is coming up next. Heading into the corporation's turn, you'll find it all laid out on the reference card at the highest level, as well as a couple bullets inside of the security unit activation to let you know the different steps we'll be moving through. And we're going through number one right now. The first one, security unit activation, is where we begin. Now the first step inside of that is to pursue. This is where detected bots in awareness are gonna be pursued by the security on the floor, but none of the bots are currently within the awareness of any security units. Therefore, there are no units for the security to pursue. We now move to investigate, and since Axis and Bit both have their awareness chips in play and they weren't pursued, their awareness chips will now be investigated by the security units. I get a choice in which of these gets resolved first. In this case, I'm choosing to resolve Axis's awareness chip first. Choosing to resolve Axis's awareness chip, we have a hamster in the hallway. That security unit is the closest, so it will be the one that investigates. And with a movement stat of two, the hamster's gonna move right one space and then turn to face the awareness chip. Now at this point, Axis is once again within the hamster's awareness and becomes detected. So the awareness chip is placed back on top of her bot chip. The hamster still needs to finish its movement, so it's gonna continue towards Axis's awareness chip by moving down one space. 
Now at this point, if you want to make note of which units you've activated and which awareness chips have already been dealt with, you're gonna flip them over. Now when you're using the different miniatures here, the brass mag miniatures that are on top magnetically, you can simply lift them off, flip the chip, put the magnet back on. For the purposes of this video, I won't be flipping them over, but on the opposite side of the chip, it will give you a great visual indication that that's already been resolved. So if you are just using the base game and you only have the chips, it's really really handy for a quick glance at what's already been taken care of. Another thing to note around the hamster is that I could have easily moved south one position and then right one position. The outcome would have still been the same. Close to bits awareness chip is the hamster in the lobby and the hamster uses its movement stat of two to move two spaces down. Then it's going to rotate to face the awareness chip. It's worth noting that Bit was detected after the hamster's first move, so her awareness chip is placed on her space. I could have chose to move the hamster right and then down both routes, get this security unit within as close a range to Bit as possible, so either are valid. The final portion of the security unit activation is patrol. So security units that can patrol are going to do so. The guards in the rooms don't patrol unless stated otherwise, so the bulldog in the security room is not going to move. The walker will patrol around the perimeter of the hallway with its movement stat of four on its chip. It will move down three spaces and then turn and move one space left. Now you're likely wondering, well, how do I know where the patrol route is? Well, when you're making a patrol, you can check out the quick reference guide on page 43, which will give an idea based on the icon for the security unit, what its patrol route is. So just so you can more visually see it, the icon that's currently on the walker I just moved is the perimeter perimeter security patrol, but you can see there's a number of different types of patrols that can happen. You got stationary, pace, perimeter, which is what I just did, unlock doors, closest bot, command module, post, and terminals. Now let's move to ping activation, something I briefly touched on when Byte and Access both went ahead and initiated their movement on the network grid here. So ping activation is part of the corporation's turn, and in this step, each ping on the network is activated. If there are pings on the network right now, they will activate starting with the pings on the most outward layers and working inwards. There isn't, so we just go right past that step, and there are procedures as to how to move the ping when it's on the map, all found inside the Learn to Play guide. Now, if there are no pings on the network, the CEO instead adds a ping to the core, but it does not move. At this point, we roll the ping die a number of times equal to the number of hubs occupied by pings at this time, and we resolve each roll as it happens if it is able to be resolved. If no pings were on hubs and the ping die was not rolled, all pings that can transfer outwards do so. Now, as I just went through, there are no pings currently on the network, so the CEO will add a ping to the core, which I've gone ahead and placed right now. Then the ping die is gonna get rolled. The roll result has an increase to the CEO's network level by one. So that die way up there in the top is gonna go from a one to a two. It's worth mentioning, I'll just go over a couple of the other sides of the die so you get an idea is what else could happen. There is one side that advances the threat, the chart just below off screen by one. There's another one that advances the threat by one and then all pings that can transfer outwards do so. The one we landed is the one that increases the network level by one. We can also find one that does that, but then also all pings that can transfer outwards do so. Another side has a CEO adding a ping to the core, and another side, the final one, the CEO adds a ping to the core, and then all pings that can transfer outwards do so. Now we should touch on being banned from the network. It's in your team's best interest to boot pings before they get out to layer one. If a ping moves onto or past the node that connects to an IP's access point, and that IP is not on their access point, the IP is banned from the network, and you remove the agent's IP peg and the network level die from the network itself and place them to the side. And it also mentions that the ping is not booted and may continue moving around layer one. But agents that have their IPs banned from the network must skip the network step of their turn. Their IP will be restored to the network when the burn cycle is next rebooted. Now when restoring, the agent would place their banned IP and network level die set back to one, as you saw at the very beginning, in any empty access point. And they do not have to use their original access point if there are others available. So there is a big time pressure to kind of be going through this network and not getting banned or knocked out of the network. The final step of the corporation turn is to advance 
events threat. So at this point, you're going to trigger any threat events hit or passed for the first time and activate any escalation points hit or passed as well. So in this two player game, being that I'm playing solo and controlling two different agents, the threat will advance by two each round. So we move the left threat tracker bead to the two spot on the threat track. It won't resolve any threat events or escalations because, well, we haven't reached any yet. Now, just to clarify threat events versus threat escalations, the first time the threat bead reaches or passes a threat event, and those are the ones that don't have any kind of color coding behind the terminology to the right. So for instance, activity tracking, remote spin down, new quotas, those are examples of threat events. And they're also square in terms of their orientation, whereas the threat escalations are more diamond, they are turned over, plus they also have a red background that helps to remind you of this. So threat events, when you reach it for the second time, because there is the opportunity for you to go up and down the threat track, you do not resolve the event again. So that is the reason why that right hand bead is there, because if we hit activity tracking with the left hand bead later on by moving up this chart, we would mark that we made it to here. It only activates the one time. And if we go up and then back down the threat track again, it's not going to hit you the second time. Now for threat escalations, whenever the threat bead is on or beyond the space of the threat escalation, the corresponding condition described on the threat card is in effect from that point forward. If the threat is reduced to below this, the condition basically dies off. So that's very much more of a dynamic situation where basically wherever this bead resides, one of these conditions could be, or maybe even all of them, could be activated and be in play at the present moment. So the second this bead gets all the way down to uh, the same level or below of monitor protocol, level one doors are now level two that much harder to access the floor and the areas and the rooms inside of it. So that's going to do it. That is a full round of burn cycle. So unless a game effect takes place at the end of the round, you proceed directly to the start of the next round and go at it again. And the first player does not pass at the end of the round. Now I do want to talk about something that is important to know, and that's about rebooting the burn cycle. So immediately before the start of any player's turn, the team, or if you're playing solo yourself, can interrupt the round in order to reboot the burn cycle. It's the team's choice as to when this happens and whether it happens, so it's completely optional, and it generally isn't done very often when the reserves are spent and the team is short on actions, though there may be other strategic reasons to reboot your burn cycle, so be aware of those and learn them, because timing is everything. Now, when you go through the resolving of a burn cycle reboot, the actual Learn to Play booklet will take you through some bulleted steps, but I'll highlight them really high level. First off, you're going to return all the action chips from the burn cycle and all its reserves to the supply. You're going to create the burn cycle just as in setup. Each player takes chips from their reserve allotment to make their reserve, and if any chip runs out, players choose how to distribute the chips. For each room that contains at least one bot, place the room's reserve allotment into the team's reserve. If a bot is on an outdoor space with an action icon on it, a matching action chip is added to the team's reserve as well. You then advance the threat by player count, and if any IPs are banned, you return their peg and network level die to an available access point. So those are the criteria or the steps to go through when you're rebooting the burn cycle. Now, as you know, the overarching goal of burn cycle to proceed and succeed is to complete floor on floor on floor. So at the end of a player's turn, if the floor's objectives are completed and all bots are in safe zones, the floor is automatically completed, and you follow steps as in the learn to play guide in terms of how you wrap up that floor. And you're gonna be moving on to the next floor from there all the way to you get to the final floor. And that, my friends, has now shown you a full round of play with explanations to help you get a better understanding of how Burn Cycle operates. And from this point in the Learn to Play guide on page 38, it will take you step by step through the rest of this floor, which I highly recommend that you do when you're learning Burn Cycle for the very first time. It'll really get used to the flow of the game to the point where you won't be referencing anything as you walk through and once you've got that handle on things you'll be able to continue to start digging into the strategy behind the game which starts to really open up as you play beyond the tutorial itself you'll always want to keep the rules reference nearby as well because if you have any stumbling spots along the way you'll be able to reference rules there but you can also go back inside the learn to play guide and check out bits of information as to explanations why certain things were done at certain steps this will all help paint the picture of how burns cycle operates.
It's worth mentioning at the very end of the Learn to Play booklet, there is a mention around finishing the tutorial in a PDF form, which you can find online, and that will take you step by step through the rest of floor number one, which will really give you everything you need to know to get going into floor two and beyond. This has been a very unique and very cool strategic offering from Chip Theory Games, different than anything that they have provided in the past in terms of gameplay. Very interesting. It will definitely be staying on my shelf for the long haul. I really hope this video series helps you guys get the game to the table and played and enjoyed. Thank you guys so much for watching. Let me know what you thought about it in the comments down below. And as always, keep on rolling solo.